1996. The survivor is Edith Fenel Milman. Her maiden name is Schmaltz. The interviewer is Elizabeth Potsy Tanner. We are in New York City, in New York, in the United States of America. The language is English, and this is tape number two. You were telling me about the rabbi and his family that you were staying with just upon arriving in Belgium. Yes. Uh, what was his name? Rabine Dr. Ansbacher. And it was, from what I understand, quite a well-known rabbinical fami family in, in Brussels. I went so far, I wanted my mother to start wearing a, a, the wig. I mean, I, I was really getting off the deep end there. Uh, a little aside, uh, I'm going to jump ahead quite a bit. In 1973, I'd gone to Israel on the high holidays, and I got caught in the Yom Kippur War. On Rosh Hashanah, I have quite a bit of family in Israel, in Tel Aviv. Uh, I was told that Rabbi Ansbacher was the rabbi of one of the, I think the, I forgot it's called, the Grand Synagogue, the Great Synagogue, something or other, in Tel Aviv, and indeed he was the rabbi there. I went there on Rosh Hashanah. And uh, of course, I, s I went up to the women's section and I met again the uh, uh, the wife of the rabbi, the Rebbitson. Introduced myself, and uh, we had a lovely conversation. And she invited uh, she invited me to come and visit them. I never did get. That visit, it, it was uh, somehow it was. I was supposed to visit them after Yom Kippur, and of course the war broke out. I never did get to to uh, visit them, but I did meet him again, and I met her again, and I just now looking for some photographs for this interview. I found a letter that he had written to me here, uh, regretting that we that we couldn't get together and uh, telling me that he, how he had, not so much how he had gotten out, but that he had gotten out and his brother was alive, and something about the little boy whom I remembered as a, as a, as a I think, a one or two-year-old kid. So that was kind of interesting, to touching base again after so many years. So this family really was your second family for a little at, while, at it that sounds? Yes, yes. So and then and I went to school in, in uh -huh. Brussels. Uh, I learned French. I went to the regular public school there. Uh, I uh, I got very active in all kind. Of, even then, there were uh, the movement toward at that time Palestine. It was Zionist. The the, the kids with this religious. Uh, Atmosphere got involved in in the movement of uh, uh, the pioneers in, in in Palestine at the time, and so we were very involved in this whole atmosphere. And uh, let me try and think. We were aware of people friends of my parents who had also arrived in Belgium, and more and more refugees still arriving, uh, uh, just escaping from Germany before they could be sent to uh, camps or whatever. They knew, we were aware of concentration camps in Belgium, that it was there, that we had escaped them, there was people coming out, exactly what was what. I personally don't remember so much uh, of what people knew, because again, it was kept from me because I was a kid, so they don't talk to me. How old were you? I was ten. ten. I was ten. 
So whatever horrors they may have found out, because I was aware that that people uh, talked about horrors. They weren't the same horrors that, that would eventually uh, uh, develop. But uh, So it, it was always in the background that we had just escaped, and things were awful there. But again, it was pretty much kept. Uh, the, 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 this atmosphere of secret secretiveness uh, was really pervasive. Did you, did you get any information that you were aware of uh, through radio and, and newspapers? I, I don't know. You don't think I, so? I don't, I, uh, maybe. I don't remember it. I don't remember it. I was very self-involved, as 10-year-old kids are. Uh, no, 11-year-old by now. Yeah, 11-year-old. And you had yeah. moved back, you said, with your parents? Yes, we had an apartment then. And I had, I had my uncle then, uh, who had daughters there. There was family there. And I had my own sort of social life. And uh, I was not unhappy in Brussels. Uh, to learn, Fre it was a sink or swim situation. You had to learn, I had to learn French. I remember a very good lesson which stood me in very good stead eventually. I found that humor does not translate very well because I would, I would make, I don't know, I would make what I considered a humorous remark and would fall on these dead ears. It made absolutely no impression whatsoever. Uh, even, even when it was understood, I became very much aware that, uh, that their cultural differences and that not everything works in exactly the same way in a different language or in a different culture. I became very much aware of that at the time. But you but were mostly surrounded by other Jewish kids at that not time? Not necessarily. Or was it, mixed? it was mixed because I went to school. There was one little girl there I remember who was Alsatian and who lived in Brussels, who spoke German. Uh, and I could communicate with her, and, uh, but, but it didn't work all that well. And then I had this aunt that was always my all-time favorite aunt. Loved that aunt. She had no children, and she was a highly educated woman, also born in Poland, my uncle's wife. Uh, I have a picture of her, so incidentally. And uh, she would help me with my homework. She spoke French. So we would have these go over the history lessons, except she was more interesting than the teacher, I think. So we really went uh, much, more, uh, much more deeply into, uh, into the history lessons. And I got interested in it, and I learned it. We read it in French, because that's how I had to read it. And I did learn French in the year and a half that I was there, and, I, and it really worked. What was her name? That was my Tante Bertha, Bertha Kurtz. Uh, she, married, she married the uncle that had introduced my father and my mother <laughs> in Berlin. And uh, let's see. So as I went to school there, I was... Uh, it was not an unhappy time for me. And then... Your father could um, settle again doing some shoe business? Or no, what no, I don't think he... Exactly, I don't know. My father always managed to make a living at something. Uh, I don't think he was allowed to work there. Just exactly, I don't remember exactly. If he, uh, I don't ask my brother, I don't, I don't mm -hmm. remember. And then on May... 10th, 1940, Belgium and Holland and Luxembourg and low countries were attacked by the Germans. That was the, the great day of the invasion, the great bombardment. Uh, and in 19, four days later, on May 14th, we left 
in one of my uncle's trucks. I think I mentioned that he had this uh, factory, the plant of, of uh, baking ovens. So he had trucks and vans and whatnot. And uh, my father, my mother, brother and I, one of uh, my uncle's uh, uh, son-in-law, a couple of friends. We were 11 people in that van. And we left Brussels with whatever fit in the van. And 12 kilometers out of Brussels, the, the truck got stuck. Uh, and we had to get out. Luckily, it got stuck right in, uh, in the middle of nowhere, but there was a farmhouse there. And the people were friendly enough to let us in. And my brother, no, I, I'm sorry, my father and my uh, cousin went out to try and look for a mechanic or somebody to try and fix the truck. Uh, and we waited and we waited and we waited and we waited. And in the meantime, uh, we, we were being bombs were falling all over the place. It was uh, bombarded very, very heavily. And what the Germans were trying to do at that time, because the roads were full of refugees, uh, they dropped bombs on the refugees, refugee cars, one by one, in order to clog the roads so that the British soldiers wouldn't be able to get through. And uh, well, that was the picture at the moment. And my father and my cousin didn't come back. And we are waiting and uh, getting more and more desperate. Um, then there were British soldiers there, and we were being, we had to leave there. We were being evacuated. This whole place was being evacuated. How, how long after? How that was four days. Uh, that was uh, the next day. We were there uh -huh. overnight, and they didn't come back. Yeah. We did not know until, well, it's a few months later, that t till we found out that my father was alive. Uh, tell you, I'll tell you my story there because that's that's. Okay, so we this British soldier helped us uh, hitchhike toward the French frontier. We had originally said that our first destination was going to be La Panne, which is right near the French border. Then the next destination was going to be Paris. And eventually, we were going to go to Bordeaux, where I had another uncle and family that had been living in Bordeaux for a long time. So that, that had been the plan. Of course, eventually, hopefully, to get out and go to Portugal, where I had another uncle. Uh, so we were trying to go toward our next point, which was La Panne. Uh, my uncle and the one of the friends, one of the women, went off her rocker. She started to undress. She was trying to get. To, she was. She wanted to to hitchhike and go back to Belgium. She was trying. To, she lifted up her skirt. You know, she was really getting out. She was get, getting the bananas, trying to get a, a ride. So she figured if she lifted up her skirt, <laughs> she'll get a ride. Uh, and my mother said, "I got to get out of here. I can't. I can't stay here with the kids." And and and, go. and at one time she started this. I remember that the woman started to scream, and my mother slapped her. I didn't know at that time that that's what you do with hyster you know, to, uh, with hysteria to calm her down. It did calm her down, and I was so shocked. I, as I say, I I remember that that incident. Uh, so we left uh, just my brother, my mother, and I. Because it was a small car, and we left. It was at that time we all tried to get out. We weren't going to get out eleven people at a time, or nine at this point. Could you take any luggage? No, there was no luggage. The only thing that I remember we always had with us. This was May, but my mother had taken her Persian lamb coat, which was it was so heavy, it was unbelievable. But she had figured just in case. 
of the flight and on the flight in case it ever gets cold or something or if it one can sell it one can cover oneself with it it was the the thing that was always present was the Persian lamb coat uh, a bag with a serrated knife that was the famous Zege mess I mean because we were kidding my mother about it so that you could cut bread a loaf of bread if and when we had it and cans of sardines always to uh, wherever we were we tried to get sardines because <laughs> we had to, we had a, <laughs> a can opener which was a wonderful thing because it did save it really it came in very very handy so that's what we took whenever uh, and we went well first with that car and then on the hay wagon and and then by any kind of means of transportation including walking we eventually got to near Lapan near Lapan we got out there someplace and I remember there were soldiers again British soldiers they were coming toward us with bayonets like this where, where are we going I don't know they didn't see the other I don't know why they asked that but and my mother was afraid my brother was 15 that he was going to be a, a he's of military age that they were going to get him for the military uh, Anyway, we talked ourselves out of that one and eventually got to La Panne. As it turned out later, as we talked with my father, and I'd like to tell that story because it runs parallel. Of course, I wasn't there, but I know the story. Uh, maybe I'll tell it while it's parallel. All right, let's leave, let's leave us in La Panne for the okay. time being. My father and my, my father didn't speak French. My cousin did speak French, but with an accent. The farmers in that section hated the Germans from the First World War yet. Uh, they were the Bosch, they were the, hated them. And they, there were indeed uh, German parachutists around. And those terrified farmers saw my father and uh, cousin coming down the parachute. I mean, they were, they were ready to lynch them. They threw stones at them. And somehow my cousin managed to get them uh, to call the British, that, because there were British soldiers around. And they did that. So the British soldiers came there. I mean, as far as they were concerned, there were these two German parachutists there. And uh, there was, uh, my father was trying to explain to them that didn't know English and didn't know French, that, you know, that he was doing business in England and he was, whatever it is that he was trying to say. And he takes out his wallet and in his nervousness drops the wallet. And the wallet falls open, and one of the things that falls out is a receipt. The receipt was from the Jewish National Fund, the Keren Kayemet, which has a very distinctive logo, it, it, the Hebrew logo. And this British young kid picks it up and looks at it, and starts to say something in Hebrew to my father. My father doesn't really speak Hebrew, but he knows prayer book Hebrew, but enough to, to understand what he was saying. And it turns out that this kid had served with the British Army in Palestine and recognized the logo and knew what it was and put two and two together and realized what had happened. So. Uh, it seems he went out. That's my, my cousin, of course, knew, who know, uh, knows French, told us that, told the populace, if you will, uh, that there were indeed parachutists and they were going to be executed at 5 o'clock in the morning. So about 4 o'clock at night, and everybody had gone home, they let them out. So he was, it was like a miracle. He was saved by this, by this receipt. 
Another story, he, they went out, continued walking, and again, they were very suspicious characters. Two men, uh, one not speaking French, the other with an accent, no luggage. Uh, wherever they went, it was very suspicious. And they're on this field, they're also trying to walk toward the French frontier. And uh, as they're walking, there are German tanks going in the other direction. And there was no place to run. And I can't quite, I can't quite picture my father doing this, but he did, obviously. Stop the German tanks, and it goes like this, and stop, the guy stops, and he says, Fahren Sie nach Brüssel, in German. He says, yeah. He says, so he took, got a ride with a German tank on a German tank to Brussels, back to Brussels, where our landlady, where we, where we had been living, who was an 80-year-old lady, hid him. He stayed with us, uh, stayed where we had been living all along, got back on the German tank to Brussels. So that was his story. Uh, that, that when those British soldiers came to us with the bayonets, that was the same little, Plotin. I don't know, the little sentinel, but whatever it was, mm. where my father was at the same time, at the, on the same day, so we didn't know that. It turned out later on that we compared dates, and, and so it, it really was that same thing. But at that point, it was the three of you, and you were just in, three of us. in La Pan. Yeah, we are now in La Pan, which is a resort, you know, and Beautiful day, sun was shining, and people were sunning themselves. And then I said, "Oh, yeah, well, the French are going to open the uh, the uh, the border any day and uh, any minute, and uh, well, we just go over to France and we'll be safe." And my mother said, "No, this is uh, not staying here. This is not." And there was no way of getting actually to the to the border itself. And I remember there was a like a, uh, yeah, what do you call this? One of those railroad, uh, you know, when you have a, ra a railroad a crossing. Okay. Yeah, uh, no, a railroad crossing that you, c uh -huh. where you close, uh, well, what's the name for this thing? Where you close a railroad. Schranken. Schranken. Yeah. That's what it was. And the schrank. <laughs> uh, what the heck is it called? Well, anyway. We'll find it. Uh, and they, you could, at that point, they had closed the French border. They, nobody was supposed to pass. And we figured they can't do that. I mean, they, eventually they have to open the, the border. And we sat at that trunk, at that railroad crossing, uh, hoping that they were going to open the border. Eventually they said, OK. The, I don't know how long it was open. It wasn't open very long. But we were there waiting for it, and we did get over. France. And then again, so now we're in France. Again, we, you know, in the meanwhile, my mother doesn't know where her husband is. We don't know, her, you know, we have no idea. All we knew is we got to push on. My mother is a little woman with a lot of guts, I must say. She was really something. Uh, again, we were hitchhiking, there were hay wagons, uh, there were a uh, little, uh, did a lot of walking. And I will say that the French people there, we had very good experiences with them. I know a lot of people didn't, but wherever we went, we were, we had help. And we eventually got, we eventually got to Dunkirk. We got to Dunkirk when they had the big bombardment. I, I, you know, there were two famous bombardments, one in Dunkirk and one in Calais. We had both of them. We were right there. I remember in, in Calais, I was, I was scared out of my head uh, of the bombs. The bombs were falling everywhere. You had the explosions. Oh, incidentally, there's another interesting story. My brother had been a stutterer from childhood. 
um, had been had quite a stuttering problem. Uh, at one point, where we were still in Belgium with the, with the bombs dropping, uh, falling wherever we were, uh, there was a little, like a little shack or a little outhouse or something like that. And we were right near there. We were trying to go toward it to, to protect ourselves or something. When that little outhouse was blown to smithereens and my brother was thrown, uh, the air pressure, I guess, was thrown. Uh, we, we weren't thrown. Well, my mother and I weren't thrown, but he was. And when he got up, it was the last of his stuttering. He never stuttered again. It was the one good thing that the Germans did for him. Isn't that amazing? Incredible. Yeah, I guess the shock or whatever it was, there was no more stuttering. Oh. Uh, it was kind of an interesting yeah. aside. Yeah. Anyway. You were telling about the second I, about I was telling, yes. I remember always, uh, I would I would sit like that with my head on my mother's lap, and my mother would sort of lean over, she would caress me and, and try and comfort me. And I knew it was I knew there were bombs. And my mother knew that I knew there were bombs. But she would tell me, you know, this is a big port, and there are lots of ships coming in. And you know, when they come in, you know, the wind sort of pushes them, pushes them against against the, uh, the, the, the sea wall there. And that's what you feel and that's what you hear. She knew I didn't believe her. I knew I didn't believe her. That, that's what I wanted to hear. It's so amazing when I said my mother really had an understanding of people. That's what she told me. And I said yes. And, and that's, it's amazing how I remember that. that it was in the 90s and such a course and shift. And and, and that's 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 how I remember the bombardment. Well, as I say, we. I remember we went to, there was a, farmhouse, and. Uh, and there was a woman who who gave us her bedroom, said, "Well, my son is in the army, and I hope somebody will do something good for him," and she let us sleep there. And I, people were really really good to us. We but got to, yes. But you were always going. You were always I was going. You, now you never the next stayed anywhere no, for a long no. period of time. We were trying to go point. then toward Paris. Yeah. So we were in Calais and the, play, the, the streets were full of, of refugees with whatever packages they could carry. And it started to rain. And uh, there were, it, it was a Sunday. I think it was a Sunday. There was a bar that opened its door. They had been closed, but they let us in. They let a lot of the refugees in. When it started to rain, they let us in. And there was a soldier, a French soldier, who kept looking at me and then asked my mother permission to speak to me. He says, he's got a little daughter about my age and he misses her. Would it be all right if he talked to me? So he sat down to me and he talked to me. And then my brother, he was going to be going to, there was going to be a train, a military train going to Paris. And my brother said, you got to get us onto this train. So he did. He threw a coat over my mother, and uh, I don't know what, how he managed. My brother, the three of us, got onto this train, which was all military. I remember that. I remember that heavy coat, which smelled. And we got onto that train from Calais to Paris. And we have to stop this second tape. Okay. <laughs>